our speaker in the plenary this morning is from the university, is from the Open University of Mauritius. Now, I'd like to point out that our University of KwaZulu-Natal, and in particular the College of Law and Management Studies, where I'm based, have a working memorandum of understanding with the Open University of Mauritius, um, including an upcoming conference in November, which we are all excited about. So, as I introduce to you the next speaker, I do so as a colleague. It is my honor and a privilege to introduce to you Dr. Kaviraj Sukun, who is not just an academic at the Open University of Mauritius, but also the founder, director general of that institution. Dr. Kaviraj Sukun is without doubt a trailblazer because he has many firsts on his CV. Apart from being the first Director General of the Open University of Mauritius, he also led the first National Human Resource Development Plan for Mauritius, and he also led the first international Cambridge, uh, the marking of the first international Cambridge International Examinations. In addition to this, he has shared his experience as a consultant to very many notable international organizations. And as all academics of good standing, he has supervised several masters and doctoral research projects. Dr. Sukan is an honorary academic at the Imperial College of London. So ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, join me in welcoming Dr. Sukan. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for this keynote address. Let me thank all the organizers, Professor Ruby, who is here, and Professor Michael, all the organizers, Yuki Zaden, for inviting me to deliver this keynote address. <coughs> uh, let me start by, again, thanking Yuki Zaden for the MOU that we have signed. And also, I take this opportunity to invite you to Mauritius on 8, 9, and 10th for the conference that we're organizing together with Yuki Zaden in Mauritius. <coughs> um, Today's, today I'm going to talk about the past, the present, and the future. Let me, let me start by telling you, when I did my PhD in computational maths, I had to go to, I had to be in UK, because you didn't have any parallel machines in Mauritius at that time. How many of you know what are parallel machines? Can you raise your hands? Yes. They were multiprocessors, machine, big machines with multiprocessors. <clears throat> Today, you have that power in a PC. At that time, we didn't have. Let me tell you another thing. When I joined as an academic, that was my first job at the University of Mauritius. The department at that time gave me a computer, <clears throat> and the computer had two megabyte RAM. And everybody was jealous because I had two megabyte RAM. What is two megabyte RAM today? So, <clears throat> storage was a big deal. Today, we are talking about terabyte, we are talking about gigabyte, and at affordable cost. Just to tell you that I'm coming from the pre-internet age. How many of you are like me in this room who know the pre-internet age? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, 
We are talking about the past, present, and future. Before I was called upon to set up the Open University in 2012, it was the Mauritius College of the Year. <clears throat> in the 70s and 80s, when we came back from school, there was one thing that we used to do, to be in front of the TV, big box TV, and then watch Mauritius College of the Year programs. Because they would air the lessons on the TV. <clears throat> and my good friend, Mr. Pavo, who is here, also worked for the MCA. By the way, if you don't know him, he's already half South African. So that, that was all that we could do. Returning from home, we had only one channel, and that channel was airing lesson on maths and science. If you wish, you could watch those. Let me not go to 70s and 80s. Let's talk about exactly what happened 20 years ago. <clears throat> Do you remember some of the things that happened 20 years ago? In exactly 1997. Among many things that happened, two things that are most interesting. The IBM's Deep Blue Computer defeated the world champion chess player, Gary Kasparov. The second thing, the Mars Pathfinder successfully landed on Mars. The NASA Pathfinder website that showed real-time images sent from Pathfinder on Mars received more than 100 million hits during its first year, first four days. In response to the popularity, NASA set up 25 mirror pages to handle the traffic. This site had set a new popularity record. I was teaching at that time at University of Mauritius, and when I was teaching to the engineering student at that time, we could accommodate all the students, engineering students, from all the different fields, I mean, mechanical, electrical, and so on, in one lecture theater, which is not possible nowadays. Most probably only one field, from one field, it is sufficient to fill the lecture theater. <clears throat> Throughout the last two decades, technology has influenced our teaching. I think the most important blessing of technology has been its role in increasing access. Even if the enrollment figures are still very bad. According to the latest UNESCO figures, about 263 million children and youth are still out of school. And the sad part of it is that 70% of them are found in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. <clears throat> A significant of those who even have access to school don't attain, are not able to attain the required standards, the required proficiency levels. This seems, if we want to give access to education to everyone, Technology is the right thing. With the power of technology comes the power of educational content. It also makes the rates affordable. So today, I invite you to reflect together on how we taught, how we are teaching, and how we will be teaching. That is how technology is likely to shape our teaching and learning too. What would be the next disruptive forces? I'll try to be provocative. Therefore, you may not always hear what you want to hear. So, I'm here to tell you what I think 
is likely to influence our teaching in future. Some crystal ball gazing. If at the end of this session you go back home or to your office and try to look for one additional tool to help you in your teaching, my job will be done. For those who are in the room who were teaching in 1997, how were we teaching at that time? How were we teaching at that time? Heavy dependence on textbook, which is still there, I suppose. Heavy dependence on hard copies of articles. I remember at that time we were paying 30 rupees per page to import a research paper. So imagine our salary we had and the amount we had to spend on getting the research papers. Overhead projectors, slides, transparencies, PowerPoint. We didn't have the videos except on TV. I certainly believe that video is one of the most powerful tools in teaching and learning. It is likely to be in future. Well, which is the most, I'm asking you this question, which is the most popular search engine we have today? Google. Agreed. But do you realize that YouTube, which is the world's second largest search engine by volume, receives more traffic from desktop users than Google itself? What people search on YouTube? How to? How can I? That is, they use it to learn. There are 23 billion videos that are viewed <coughs> daily. 10 billion on Snapchat. 8 billion on Facebook. And between 4 to 5 billion on YouTube. This is what is referred to by many as rich content. We tend to assume that when we teach, all students in the class are learning at the same place, at the same pace. And that's the natural assumption of many teachers and which is the wrong assumption. We very often come into the class, start teaching, fantastic lecture, we go back thinking everybody has understood. <clears throat> this is not truly the case, you will agree with me. Videos can give you the power, can give the power to the students to learn at their pace. They can of course rewind, forward, pause the video, but they can't rewind, forward, pose the professor or the teacher in school, in the classroom. What is the vid volume of video content you are, are you using currently? Little? Quite a lot. We, we, we tend to use it a lot at open universities because we believe that it's the powerful tool that we have. How many <coughs> videos today? Uh, yesterday I was watching one of, one of our parliamentarian did something which is not correct, and it is already on a short 30-second video, and it has gone viral. Everybody has it today on the WhatsApp. So, and because you have mobile phone, how many smartphones did we have in 1997? How many smartphones did we have in 1997? Zero. I'm telling you that to tell you how things have moved. But have we moved in our teaching? How much of our teaching has changed? How many smartphones we have today? 
3.9 billion. The majority, 90%, are for 3G and 4G. By 2022, it is expected that we are going to reach 6.8 billion. How many apps were downloaded in 1997? According to you. Zero. And how many apps are downloaded today? 197 billion. It's true that the first app was created by Steve Jobs in 1983 with the calendars and so on for the computer. But the app that we know today was created came, came for the first time in 2008. They will be celebrating their 10th year next year. <clears throat> so I would like you to think about the proliferation within 10 years. And believe me, this is going to increase. The impact that they have on the lives of billions of people, the impact that they have on our students, the impact that they are likely to have on our students. This is a call for all educators and teachers not to stand still in this era of rapid prolifer uh, proliferation of technological tools. Ladies and gentlemen, we didn't have many of the tools you have today. Many of you must be using one or more of these. Moodle is very common today. MOOCs, videos. Note that the proliferation will not stop. Let's see some of the figures. Who has adopted what? <clears throat> Annual growth continues, particularly in the number of mobile social users, which hits 37% this year. More than 2 billion people on Facebook each month. How many of you have a Facebook account? Don't be shy. It's, how many of you have two Facebook accounts? And how many of you have integrated Facebook in teaching? Well, how many of you use WhatsApp? How many of you have a group account on WhatsApp with your students? It's good. Well, what's growing fast? The number of people using social media on their mobile is growing at the fastest rate. This is a clear indication of where the interaction between teacher and student can take place. Mobile learning is yet to become a reality. We need to start thinking of how we can make the most of it. <clears throat> we should also note that in terms of active daily use, Facebook is also in the lead. 76% of users log in daily, while 51% do so for Instagram, which is also owned by Facebook, by the way, as you know. There is something that is attracting the users to Facebook. It is unlikely that this trend will decrease. Of course, instead of Facebook tomorrow, we can have something else. But there will always be something in the social media that is likely to attract the new generation. This shows that social media is likely to be present for a very, very long time. Therefore, we should see how to make an optimum use of them. Discussions 
posts and updates in real time can be made accessible and it is free. However, you have to be careful. We burnt our hands with that as well. Inaccurate information can be posted. We have had such experiences, right? Students who are not satisfied may vent their feeling on those pages. So therefore, you must set some basic rules related to the use of social media. <clears throat> Content can always be vetted by moderators. Shift is happening. It will only accelerate in future. We can't ignore that. The big question, however, is to ask how much computing power and access will be in the pocket of the future learners. Therefore, I challenge you to think only, not only, I challenge you not to think only about how to integrate today's technology in your teaching and learning process, but to dream of what can happen in future. We must mine these trends. We must sit down and think about these trends thoroughly. I'm both happy and afraid when I see the power of computers. Computers' ability to do things is increasing exponentially. This is indeed a very good news. There are many things that we thought only human could do are being done today by robots. Well, this is a good news and a bad news at the same time. For example, today, if you are, I hope not, if you happen to be in a uh, in hospital, operation theater, you will see the large number of machines. So the medical doctors should know how to manage those machines. <clears throat> this is likely to lead to another facet of rapid, lead to another facet of rapid acceleration of technology. It is believed that 50% of jobs are at risk within the next 20 years. Robots are eating the jobs of the past. Should we be afraid? Well, yes, if we continue to teach in the way we are teaching today. Robotics eat jobs but create others, different type of jobs. Therefore, all of us present today are challenged to ensure that whatever we will teach will continue to be relevant. What are the skills and competencies our future learners should have? This is the question that we should be asking. Ladies and gentlemen, education is one of the rare sectors where innovation is very low. We are still traditional. We are often teaching in the same way as we were told because we believe that we are successful. Therefore, if I teach in the same way, my students will be successful. <clears throat> Do you know how children view schooling today? They compare it to us when we are traveling in the airplane. Once you're in the airplane and the time, it's time to take off, what happens? You are asked to switch off all your mobile phone, all electronic equipment. Same thing we do in the classroom. And then we are asked to trust someone, the pilot who is sitting in front, whom we don't know, right? Whom we don't see. <clears throat> so, wh what I want to tell you is that we have somewhere failed to adapt our schools to our learners. <clears throat> we used to have an old system where people learned, worked, and eventually 
retired. Unfortunately, this model is changing. The new model is about lifelong learning, as people are no more retiring at an early age. However, they have to adapt to the new world, led by technological innovations. Therefore, universities will have to adapt to the new learners. Access will remain a big issue if you don't do anything, as number of learners knocking at our doors will keep on increasing. Why we should be thinking of integrating technology? This year, Intel announced, earlier this year in March, Intel announced that it can pack more than 100 million transistors in each square millimeter of chip. And this has happened for the first time in the history, industry's history. Delivering more transistors in the same area means circuitry can be smaller, saving cost. It also means more functionality can be added to a chip without having to make it bigger. Cost of storage is declining fast. Cost of computing is declining fast. I take an example. The organizers have given you a pen drive. If you lose it, you will not go to the police station to report that, unless you have something really serious on that. But imagine 10 years ago when you purchased a pen drive. You had to put a keychain in it to ensure that it's not lost. It was expensive. It meant a lot. <clears throat> Globally, it is estimated that over 2.1 million students are currently seeking an international higher education student place. On average, an annual growth of 6% is expected. By 2035, they're expected to be 2.7 billion students worldwide. And in order to meet higher education demand under the current structure, you need to create two universities every day over the next 20 years. Do you think this would be possible to create two universities every day? <clears throat> if, we if we want to increase access, the answer is technology. The future is about access, anywhere, learning, collaboration, both locally and globally. By its very nature, technology changes at fast pace and making it accessible to pupils, teachers, and others is an ongoing challenge. Technology can often be a barrier to teaching and learning. I think that today we have the cloud. The cloud technology is going a long way to remove this barrier. You no more have to worry about the system going down, the software not working, somebody else is taking care of it. What schools need would be a robust connection and infrastructure. <clears throat> the investment in technology is increasing rapidly. The education market is today worth $5 trillion, eight times that of the size of software market, three times size of media and entertainment industry, and yet education is only 2% digitized. We can tap on various open sources. One of them is TinCan. TinCan uh, allows you to track learning experiences both direct and indirect. It is, uh, all those who know this standard, it is one of the standards which is um, after, has come after SCORM. Therefore, TINCAN and SCORM are available to help us track the learning that takes place. <clears throat> Blockchain for learning. We know bitcoins, many of you may be having bitcoins, so blockchain for learning allow 
people to show their own creative works and ideas to the world, staking a claim for invention and gaining recognition. Let's now consider a few teaching and learning methods that are likely to be popular in future. Gamification. How many of you like to play games? And how many of you have seen children age one or two playing games without having been taught? Isn't it? It comes naturally. So, everyone masters games practically effortlessly. The beautiful thing is that both the e-learning and the games share the same electronic platform. Isn't that fantastic? With the increasing power of videos and mobiles, there is a potential of integrating games and entertainment to create an immersive experience that can accelerate the learning process. Of course, the cost of producing these materials can be high, but if there are people, who, experts who come together to produce these materials, I think they will be affordable. The second thing, augmented and virtual reality. As you know, we have, we had Pokemon Go. You have played that. Pokemon Go. We, we, we used to think, until recently, eh, we used to think that augmented reality and virtual reality will be not for tomorrow. But when we had Pokemon Go, we saw that it is accessible to everyone. Even the forthcoming iPhone is expected to have the augmented reality feature. As I said earlier, augmented and virtual reality is likely to become 5.2 billion USD industry by next year. But just look at the way we are teaching. Our textbooks and learning materials have remained the same. Just imagine how interesting it would be when a student opens a book with a pair of special glasses and a three-dimensional image pops up at her. Now, instead of seeing a simple flat image, they can see that from various angles. I'm sure that this is going to appeal to learners from different abilities. Of course, the question is always, when I, when I talk about that, the question is always about the cost. But Google Cardboard is making it accessible. There are many virtual schools as well that are already in operation, some of which you know already, the Khan Academy, the Florida Virtual School, Guided Online Academic Learning Academy. The flipped classroom, some of you may be using it, but technology is making flipped classroom even more accessible. In flipped classroom, as you know, the learners exposed to all the lecture notes, everything. When they come in the lecture, they come for discussion, problem solving. So all the lectures can be recorded, you can have all the materials, but use the contact time for problem solving. So flipped classroom. <clears throat> um, on top of the hard skills at Open University, we, we teach soft skills. The soft skills are very, very important. In fact, from day one that we started, we, we started Open University, we, we gave, we are still giving employability skills for free to all our graduates because we believe that this is what employers are looking for. Now, it's easily said than done how to inculcate these soft skills. You have the productive failure method where projects are given to the students 
a bit like what I um, talk about the flipped classroom, and the students work on the project, right? This allows them to acquire a lot of skills. They become creative. They better understand instructions. They can fail. And in the process, they build resilience. However, academics need to be well prepared for that. Teach back, where learners are asked to teach. And whenever uh, there's an error, they stopped. So learners are called upon to teach. Now, I believe that personalized learning is likely to become more and more popular. Students have more opportunities to learn at different times and at different places. They can use different tools. Free choice, they can use any device that they want, any platform that they feel at ease. Micro-learning is becoming even more popular, where instead of asking a student, come, we are, you are going to have a degree in three years or five years or four years, you are providing that learning in smaller chunks rather than a number of years. And collaboration, as I said today, collaboration is easier with all the tools that we have. There's the rise of micro-credential is likely to take place. I'm going a bit faster now. Uh, let me tell you a story. At a recent conference in US, one of the, one of the person was called upon to um, participate as a panelist. And she had an MBA and was out of job for a few years, having a number of years of experience. And uh, she said that she applied with her MBA and with the number of years of experience, but she couldn't secure a job. So what she did, she took a number of online courses at IBM's Big Data University, earning a number of badges. Badges are becoming more and more popular through Pearson's acclaim, and almost right away, she received a job offer as information architect at a software company. Why would online badgers, not an MBA, provide the right credential for prospective employers? This is because employers are looking for proof. Are you able to do it? A university diploma or certificate may qualify graduates to apply for a certain occupation but it does not explain what students have done and how they perform on projects or tasks. So whenever you have problems, students are facing problems and job change is likely to, to, to come more frequently, the micro-credentials are very helpful and universities should think about providing them. I must tell you that this is already happening. <clears throat> if you, you know, most of you know edX very well. Students, uh, several institutions in the edX consortium, including MIT, Columbia University, announced last fall the creation of micro masters online <clears throat> programs on subjects such as artificial intelligence, supply chain, management, and user experience research. The success of these programs prompted nine additional universities to start offering MicroMasters on the edX platform. Okay. Uh, th these are a few educational technology companies that you may wish to follow, read about. I think that they are already doing a fantastic job and they are likely to continue. I will. Uh, you, okay, three more minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there are certain technologies that are already available 
for lecture capturing, online collaboration, online discussions <clears throat> that you may wish to consider in your teaching. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sukun. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, please let's give him a, a louder uh, round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Sukun's presentation truly compels us to reflect on um, the comfort zones we've been so accustomed to and how we relate to uh, pedagogy. He's forced us to look at the past, to look at the present, to look at the future. I'll now open up um, space for, for a discussion, but before I do so, I would like that we re also reflect on how we ensure universal access and ability to use this technology so that it becomes a bridging tool and not an alienating tool, um, as can indeed happen if we assume that everybody in all the far-flung areas and localities of South Africa and indeed the African continent and other developing places that they would equally have access to um, the technology, that they would equally have the capacity to take advantage of this uh, technology. I will take your comments and questions in batches of two and respectfully request that you your comments, your questions are really on point, that they are precise, that they are succinct, so that we can fit in as many questions as we can in the next um, 10, 15 minutes or so. Who'd like to go first? I see a hand there. You're the first one. And the rest have been stunned. <laughs> Okay, please go. Good morning, uh, it's Dr. Gavinder from UKZN. I, I've been asked to stand. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sukun, for your very enlightening talk. I've been dabbling a bit with ICT teaching as well, and recently I introduced pre-service teachers to use cell phones in my lecture theater. I, and then when I went around, I found some very interesting material, material enough to shock uh, UFNA, the late UFNA who passed away, and it was quite stiff now. So uh, the question is, uh, how do we manage ethical use of resources in class? Because generally, I found students go to sites that you don't want them to go. So that is one of my questions that I would like to uh, pose to you. Thank you, Dr. Gaffender. Any other question before we allow Dr. Sukun to respond? No other question, okay. Well, I think your IT guy should do the job because I think all students would be connected to the Wi-Fi. And the Wi-Fi, this is where they can block it there, all the sites that you don't want them to go to. Right, so I think this is done um, all the time by the IT guys. If you tell them they're fantastic at it to block those sites. Uh, <clears throat> let me tell you one thing. It may happen that they go to other sites than the one that you are looking at. But the way we engage them in the discussion, because they will have to contribute, for instance, giving them an assignment, telling them that, you know, you are going to be marked based on the discussion, on the contribution that you make to the discussion online, or whatever platform you're using. You can do it on Moodle, you can do it on Facebook, you can do it anywhere, so on the contribution. So this works, believe me, it works. And for, for the sites you want to block, IT guys. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question. Uh, yes, please hand, the, hand over the mic, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I want to start by commending Dr. Sukon for a very interesting and eye-opening uh, presentation. Mine is just a comment, not a question. Uh, 
basing on uh, looking at this presentation, I think also industry is coming in to support use of technology in learning. I remember yesterday, if I remember well, I heard in the news that Vodacom is now offering free data for students in institutions of higher learning and lecturers to those who are using the Vodacom lines. They can download information freely. And they were saying they've already started that on 19 universities out of the 23, 26. So we can see that even industry is also coming in to support use of technology in teaching and learning. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am, for your comment. I don't see any other hand up. Uh, could I perhaps also pose a question and request Dr. Sukhan to elaborate um, just slightly on the concept of gamification and how it could pan out in a higher education institution setting? Thank you. Being someone um, who teaches statistics, I, will, I don't know whether this was deliberate that you align all the keynote speakers from mathematics background <laughs> from yesterday. Uh, you know, games, if you, in higher education, if you're teaching statistics, statistics can be something, a headache. How many of you hate statistics here? <laughs> I, I usually teach uh, statistics to doctoral students, those who are doing their PhD. And believe me, some of them really hate it but they have to do it, unfortunately. But imagine, imagine a, a simple concept like mean. We all learn about mean from primary school. What is mean? But how many of us really understand what mean means? The average. At the end of the day, what does mean indicate to us? It is about sharing, isn't it? If we, have, if we are playing games, we all have a certain number of objects. We keep on sharing until we have, there are five people. One has 10, the other one has 20, the other one has 30, the other one has 60. We keep on sharing, playing the games until everybody has the same number. And this is what is mean all about, isn't it? Other thing about, that's a game where you can use to explain very simple concept like a meme, which can be done very easily through game. The student understand what means is all about. Other statistical concepts like variance, very powerful statistics, variance, what it is used for, variance. You use it today in all spheres, even in finance, when you are talking about <clears throat> shares, use variance to measure risk. What is variance? Right? With games, you can show the spread, because what it measures is a spread, isn't it? When we talk about skewness, when not to use mean, because we, those who hate statistics tend to use mean every time. There are many cases where we should not be using the mean. So through games, it's easier. And now in your case, I think <clears throat> in case of law, in case of in any other discipline, this would be easier to teach, like finance, trading. When, when I did my MBA, we had to <clears throat> to run a, um, a company. We were given some uh, amount of money, so we had to run it. So the company who is more profitable at the end would get higher mark. Of course, it's a teamwork. So again, it's about using the games you play. It's real fun. We, I remember having spent nights playing because it was real fun because how many people you're going to recruit, how many people you're going to sack, all right? So you're learning how to run the enterprise. Trading as well. So lots of opportunities.
Thank you very much. Oh, this. Oh, okay. I think yours will be the last question. If you could please, yes, go ahead. Um, thank you for the presentation, Doctor. Uh, um, my name is Dolin Tembu. I'm coming from the University of the First State. Um, the campus is the Kroger campus, which is a rural campus. I am not asking you a question just to add up on what you said according to our experience with the digital badges. Our we didn't see the importance of implementing the usage of technology in um, education if we were not training our students. And we developed a framework where now we induct our first year students from 2013 who came in. So now I can proudly say um, our now currently third year students um, can make use of technology given that they were all inducted at the same time in the beginning of the year. Now, the training was set up that they had to sit for a maximum of two hours, which was quite a stretch for the students to, who are fresh from high school to grasp, grasp all the information. And we moved from that kind of a setup to training them to um, a self-paced training that occurs in a period of two weeks. The promise was you get a digital badge. Because we thought if we now say, this is the technology we use at the university, go through it on your own, therefore you'll be able to use the system. And we, we wouldn't um, actually be achieving the um, plan of having our students trained on how to use technology. Now, the digital page gets the student to attend the sessions, introduce to what the sessions are about, and learn on their own with the hope of passing per assessment to, ob to obtain that badge at the end of the two weeks of completion. So yes, these digital badges do add value to um, the usage of the system. Thank you. Thank you, thank you ma'am for, for the comment. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think that brings us to the end of the session. We thank you Dr. Sukan for your very uh, insightful uh, comments, and we truly appreciate that. Um, Dr. Rabi, there's something? Oh. Okay, and uh, in true KwaZulu, province of KwaZulu Natal style, um, we are very generous people. <laughs> and we give this to you with love and gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, um, as I arrived at Durban, arrived in Durban, I had a cold, so my voice was not too good, but thank you for bearing with me and have a nice conference. Thank you. <laughs>